those who don't know, um, I'm John, John Hayes, Business Development Manager here uh, at Oasis. Um, Oasis software stands for Ove Arab Systems. Uh, we're effectively the software house of Arab. All of the software that we uh, have available commercially uh, starts life as a uh, uh, as an internal solution within Arup and, and commercialised based on it, its success. Mass motion is no difference to that and is going to be today's topic. Um, obviously, the, with, with the latest release of Mass Motion 11.8, um, I'm pleased to be joined by Lachlan uh, Miles, the product director. Uh, to uh, to run through today's webinar, where we'll be discussing not only the sort of the new releases, but um, uh, the discussion towards a broader understanding of space. We'll just have a little bit of housekeeping before I do hand the reins over to Lachlan. Um, on the top right hand corner, uh, you'll see a Q and A tab. Please pop in any questions that you that you do have for the. Uh, uh, during the webinar and we'll have a Q&A session in the end. If you don't have the Q&A tab and, or you can't locate it and you just see the, the the chat window, please feel free to put the questions in the chat and, and someone will move the question over. Uh, so without any further ado, what I'll do is I'll hand over now to Lachlan, as I say, who is our product director for Mass Motion, uh, to take you through some, uh, some of the exciting new features uh, that are now available with Mass Motion. Thanks, John. Um, and uh, more importantly, uh, thanks everyone for attending and thanks very much for your time. Um, looking forward to, to having a chat over the next little bit. So uh, what we're going to do for the next little while is just give a little bit of a refresh on what mass motion is, won't take too long, um, speak about some of the new features, but sort of why we have decided to, to push them out, um, have a conversation as to one, one or two of them in slightly more detail rather than just kind of giving you a list of features. And then having a bit of a conversation around where the software is going and what the direction of travel is, uh, because I think it's not so much about thinking about things from a release to release point uh, on behalf of the product team. It's really about how we try and change the product to be more effective um, and then would really, really enjoy answering a bunch of questions and getting into a bit of a discussion towards the end. Um, so without further ado, what is mass motion? I think most of the people, if you've joined a mass motion webinar, you've probably got a fair idea, um, but just a little bit about the history overall. As John said, um, typically some of the products that Oasis sells come from a particular design problem or a particular issue that needs to be solved uh, by, by, a, by a single engineering firm. And then they grow into something that's slightly more flexible and robust to become commercial grade software. I think from Mass Motion's perspective, it's, it's very true that it was born initially in the transportation sector, but very much solving design questions. And so looking at how things can be sized effectively or how to extend the life of a building or a space. Um, over the last few years, we've been focusing not just on that question in particular, because we think we have a fairly robust feature set around that, um, but really looking at how we can start to look at the user experience of a space. And so while we're still making sure that we can cover design optioneering and making sure that we're, we're doing a better job around that, really focusing on not just looking at things from a capacity perspective or looking at things from a uh, how long will my design life live or what is a more efficient option here to really start saying what are the, the impacts of this space on people. And so that's been something that we've been focusing on for a little while, but really kind of leaning into that more and more effectively. And so when we talk about the future, uh, I will give a bit more context around that, but also it, it informs some of the new features that you'll hear talked about today. Um, a secondary focus is also uh, looking at the flexibility of the solution. Uh, for those of you on the call who've used Mass Motion a fair bit, uh, I like to think that it's the most flexible tool uh, in its class or, or in the industry to solve these types of problems and making sure that we can build something that is not just narrowly focused on one industry is really, really important to us. Um, and by that, I mean the flexibility of, of designs and the flexibility of questions that it can answer, but also the understanding of different types of people. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's one of the, the big focus areas that we're looking at um, for this release and also for future releases. So just in terms of that's where we are, that's where the product was born, this is where we're going. So. Um, 
a quick rundown on a couple of new things. Um, I'm going to split this up in terms of new features and then things that have got better. The things that have got better usually targeted towards people who use mass motion in their day to day lives. Um, the new features might be useful in different areas. And so um, we'll just run through those very quickly. If people have specific questions around how should this be used, could this be used in this context, please do jump into the Q&A tab, as John was mentioning, and um, I'd be delighted to, to go through a potential use case and kind of step through them one by one, if people would like. Uh, so we have spent a bunch of time coming up with a number of different ways that you can interrogate data effectively. Uh, for those of you who come from uh, a design background, one of the main things that uh, you will commonly get asked is what is the difference? What is the effective difference between, say, option A and option B for, for a given design? Um, when you are explaining that to people at, say, the management level or some people, you know, the direct clients that you're engaged with, and that could be at a transportation agency, it could be at a uh, private sector organization, it could be if you're working or within um, an architecture firm, things like that, you might show people something like a, a density map showing the pedestrian level of service or looking at the evacuation time across the map. Um, and that's usually quite a good way to communicate some of those things, to take a look at different options and say, so here are some of the areas that you need to be worried about, or here are some areas which are potentially underutilized that could be spaces for commercial activation or something like that. Sometimes when you roll things up though, uh, what you need is not really a map. You need a, uh, this option is 30% worse. This option is 20% better. What you need is that highlight statistic and that one piece of analytics that basically can cut through at the decision-making level. And so we heard from a number of our users that that is how they're using the product and that they really wanted to make that easier. And so one thing that we've developed in, in the latest version of Mass Motion is every single map that you can produce, you can also, uh, you can generate with one click uh, a histogram looking at the various different, it could be level of service thresholds or it could be time thresholds or anything like that and then export that out to a CSV. So getting a quick visual representation uh, and also the ability to post-process that data. So you can now quickly say, I have two platform configurations. One of these has 33% more level of service worse than C. And so being able to communicate things quite clearly with your clients uh, and with the, the people that consume the data that comes out of mass motion. And I think that's a, that's a relatively important thing, but it's just about making sure that you can get to that headline information substantially faster. We've also, um, in line with something that we've been doing over the last little while, is we realized that the pace of design has increased uh, dramatically and the pace of client demands and the, the, the amount of analysis that needs to be brought to bear. And that could be within a business case, or it could be within an optioneering process for something in say the themed entertainment world where you need to look at a lot of things faster. And I think the only way to, to really look into that is looking into how we automate certain things. And so uh, hopefully not news to most people on the call, but we have a software development kit SDK um, which allows you to automate basically everything that you see in mass motion. There were a few gaps because they were quite challenging uh, to, to put within our automation framework and also the, the script object, uh, which allows you to, to kind of do some of that automation directly within the, within the product. We are now very confident that almost everything that you can do within mass motion, you can do uh, using the software development kit. So some of the, the larger outstanding issues that we have addressed in this release is uh, interrogating our elevator system. So the elevator system was something that was asked for uh, for a long period of time. We've had it for a few years now, but we have found that some people are interested in say a particular uh, control system that doesn't necessarily, uh, that might be bespoke, but doesn't necessarily exist in the, in the vanilla software. Or you might be looking at something as simple as, I just wanna hold the elevator for a certain period of time at a certain part of the day hold it until you have no one queuing for it, something along those lines. That's actually relatively challenging to do uh, through the UI just because it's such an emergent and dynamic property. We've made it quite trivially easy to do uh, using the script object and the software development kit. So if anyone has specific examples of that, I'd be happy to talk about them. But it's basically the last area where we had some uh, gaps within our automation framework that have now been filled. And so that's a very proud moment for the team. 
And uh, I think if anyone wants to automate something and they are unsure how to in mouse motion, please do reach out to the team because we'd love to have a conversation. Finally, in terms of new features, uh, we, we heard from a number of different users that sometimes, especially when you're looking at large multi-level spaces, that uh, orientating yourselves around an area was sometimes a bit challenging and just getting some additional context would be, would be useful. This is following up on some of the work that we did in the previous version, looking at the ability to, to dynamically create cross-section boxes, um, but making sure that we can have a reference grid that is not just something that gives some visual context, but also the ability to uh, snap to that grid. So from a measurement perspective, from a moving around perspective, it's substantially easier. And I can, I'm happy to go into various different um, options for that, but please do check it out. Uh, as a side point, if some of you are heavy users and this is a, something that you don't want to see, you can also turn it off and turn it off by default. So it's a it's an optional setting, but it's something that, that we're responding to feedback that we think is quite useful. I talked about new maps. I talked about the ability to extract information to really get to the heart of, of what we're doing in the design process. One of the, the maps that I really do want to talk about, and this is why this, this webinar is, is titled the way that it is, towards a broader understanding of space, is really we're trying very hard from a research perspective and from an implementation perspective to try and be responsible members of the architecture, engineering, construction sector, uh, or beyond, basically anywhere that has a human movement component. And we realize that when mass motion was built, fundamentally you were solving uh, or addressing capacity questions. Do I need two escalators? Do I need three? Should my platform be eight meters wide? Should it be 8.2 meters wide? Uh, what is my effective door width for evacuation? Uh, do I need a set of double doors or something along those lines? As I was saying, mass motion has got has been used more and more from a user experience perspective. And I think a really important part of that user experience is making sure that we're looking into a maximal definition of what we mean by can people access this space. And so I want to talk a little bit about the static accessibility map. Some of you will be familiar with our concept of networks. And so it is the ability to very, very quickly develop a, a system within a mass motion model that allows you to look at people with different levels of disability. And so being able to say there is a proportion of my population that uh, does not and cannot use uh, as part of its network calculations, stairs or escalators. So folks that have to use ramps to, to move from A to B, ramps or elevators, something along those lines. And so there are different ways that you can configure a network, but it is, a, I think, a flexible system to address that. I will talk about sort of pre-baked um, profiles for uh, pre-baked profiles for wheelchairs specifically uh, a little bit later. But um, this is the way that we thought that we could do this in a in a sort of a maximally flexible way because there's so much diversity across the world. The static accessibility map allows you to before you've actually run any models and before you've looked into the design um, to really start to say which of the areas of my model is there the greatest delta between how someone can get to a destination if they are able to move anywhere uh, and if you cannot and so effectively let me give you an example so what we see here is a fairly simple uh, rail platform that we have on the screen to be able to draw a quick map and say if i'm going to any spot any one of those platforms on the platform level where is the largest difference if I can't use the stairs or the escalators. And so really what I'm trying to get out here and what we as a team are trying to do is give people different analytics to look at not just capacity, but to look at things like accessibility, to look at things like equity, to say, if I have two designs, one of these might be slightly smaller, which will have a cost implication. One of them will be more efficient for bulk crowds of people, which is great, feeds into business cases, things along those lines. Um, but if I have two options, maybe one of them, it is twice as bad for someone who's in a wheelchair for certain parts of this. And for my other option, it's 10 times as bad. And if I'm able to put my elevator up the other end of the platform, or if I'm able to have an elevator at each end of the platform, there are definite design drawbacks to that. But for a portion of the population who are going to use my space, that is a profoundly enhanced experience. And that's something that I think the the users of tools like mass motion 
are able to have that conversation with the people who are making decisions about how to design and operate spaces. And so we're quite proud of this. It is relatively early doors, so you can use this right now when you download Mass Motion. Um, I, I do have a quick question for everyone who is joining in this. If it is, hey, this is really useful uh, and I've used it in order to, to try and make my spaces better for folks with, with disabilities, I'd love to hear about that. But equally, I would love to use this, but all I need is this one extra thing that would make it two times as useful. That's actually more important to us because we wanna keep getting better with this. And so please do reach out if there's a, I would love to use this if only it had X would be extremely useful. But it is it is one way in which we can use our existing tools to really take a look at how spaces evolve and who we are letting down or ignoring or not putting enough focus on in the design process. And so that's where we're going overall, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But this map in particular is, is consider it a first step effectively into how we are looking into spaces. And so happy to take questions on that as we as we get into that that stage. Um, but it's not just those two things, and it's not just those few new features. There's a there's a number of different things that we've put out. Uh, some of you on the call will know, and this is a, a segue into me talking about the long term, that we have spent a, a lot of time over the last little while looking into a, a fundamental restructure of the engine that underpins mass motion. And uh, as a result of that, that's been ongoing for some time. The research work is ongoing. The development work is ongoing. Uh, I would say it is broadly on track after a uh, slight um, pivot that was needed to be made in 2020, which we don't really need to go into because I'm sure everyone here remembers the pandemic. Um, there are some things that are coming out of that, um, that effort that we don't want to wait for the full new engine. We're, we're bringing it into the hands of users right now, effectively. And so we have made, in in sort of in combination with changes to some of the maps, the ability pr to produce other data. We've also taken another look at how they actually generate. Um, for people who work on extremely large models, sometimes this can take, uh, you know, it's a sort of multiple minutes process or operation. Um, we've made them on average an order of magnitude faster. And so, you know, 10 times faster is a fairly significant speed up um, with basically no net change to accuracy or things like that. There is a slight difference in the calculation. So to go into that, um, we've, we've been transparent about that in the help guide, but effectively we have made getting that information out substantially faster, which should be something that happens every time you generate a map in mass motion. And so we're, we're chuffed with that, I think. Um, along the same lines, uh, we realize that as people are doing more and more with mass motion, that in the current version of the software, uh, as you produce the various different databases that comprise your different, it uh, could be de design scenarios, they could be operational scenarios, things along that, those lines. Sometimes they can be quite large. Like some of our users will be working on say a major airport, uh, which needs to run for a substantial amount of time to take into account the difference between a domestic and international uh, arrivals, departures, those sorts of things. The model in terms of model time might take uh, over 24 hours. And so that model will run faster than real time, but the uh, the end of that will mean that you have a large database file that takes up a, a lot of space locally. We've effectively, due to some compression tricks that we're putting in to the new engine, we've effectively cut down the database size by half. So easy way to think about it. Um, if you have a certain amount of your C drive that you're using for mass motion, you can now do twice as much. So we think that's a, that should that should come across uh, and should be like relatively well received um, and happy to answer detailed questions on that. Uh, the final one is those of you who've been using the script object, uh, this was effectively us putting a, a Python development environment uh, within mass motion, just for people who might not want to, to dive with both feet into our software development kit and really looking at uh, trying to make things like simple automation. So I want to change an agent's speed when they're in a certain part of the model. I want to, uh, every time I run a new model, I want to run a, a quick script to extract two maps, three tables, uh, and a graph from each database that I have. I want to uh, quickly, um, and it could be something along the lines of, I want to quickly move or rename a whole bunch of portals, things like that, where you don't necessarily want to stop what you're doing or mess around with like a different building up a, 
development environment or playing around. We we brought a Python development environment directly within Mass Motion itself. And so if you haven't checked it out yet, please do, because it's now got substantially easier to use. So we were working with things like uh, adding some autocomplete. We have added the ability to, to find and replace um, syntax highlighting. There's a number of different things that make it a full featured uh, code editor. So the more familiar you are with programming, the easier it will be. Also, if you're not that familiar, it will also come across slightly more uh, human readable. Um, and so that's something that we're quite proud of and will continue to improve over time. So I've been speaking for around about 20 minutes and that's some of the things that are within the current version of Mass Motion. So again, that's available now. Um, there are things that, that we would love your feedback on and there are things that we are uh, just hoping that will be well received because we don't really need feedback on. We've made things smaller. So hopefully that is a, is a good thing. But I did want to make sure that we're just being transparent about where we're going as a product. And so some of the changes that, that I've been outlining over the last 15 or 20 minutes are a, an overall attempt to pivot a software that was born in the design industry to start looking at a more holistic interpretation of how people move through a space. And so what I mean by that is I, I don't think I'm going out on too much of a limb here to say that um, particularly in the transportation industry where, where mass motion was born, the focus is around capacity and around the average person uh, and typically based on design standards or typically based on uh, regulatory environments around the world that tend to not necessarily encompass the diversity of spaces and use types that we have today. And so we want to respond to that and anticipate changes in that as best we can. And so the best way that we can do that is making sure that rather than, than basing things on stuff that's come before is that we are making sure that we are as tightly coupled with the academic world. And some of you might be joining from various different academic institutions um, as possible. And so over the last year or so, we have, um, we've really beefed up our our commitment to that and our resourcing for that. So we've actually, we've brought in a full-time researcher, Sarah, if you're on the call, thank you, um, to, to liaise with various different universities, but also to um, digest and um, translate for our development team the some of the absolute cutting edge in how people move. And so I want to spend a little bit of time on that because it's not just the mechanics of movement. So something like how do groups move? How does a family group uh, circulate or queue? It's a relatively well understood phenomenon. The challenge, and this is something that we're actively working on, is how you integrate it in a flexible way where the user doesn't have to do any micromanagement. And so we're working through that, but the actual research of how people move and how people oscillate is relatively well understood how people evacuate in circumstance, cir certain circumstances is a very vibrant area of research. And it's something that we feel that a partnership approach is, is really, really good. And so we're helping to drive some research in some points, um, directly funding that or directly partnering with folks on that. And sometimes it is learning and trying to, to fold that into the software as best we can. One thing that I do want to mention is, is not just about the mechanics of movement, but it's about how people make decisions. Those of you who are familiar with mass motion and from a usage perspective know that it was designed so that you didn't have to micromanage how people moved around. You would set your origin and your destination. Sometimes you would give a list of actions that would say, here are some, some intermediate tasks that I need to address along the way. And the agents would figure it out and you say, how would they figure it out? Well, it's based on a, a kind of a rational approach that they have good information about the space. They make fundamentally rational decisions about how to move from A to B, taking into account things like local congestion, stuff along those lines. That is a completely valid way that people move around. It is not the only way in which people move around. So we're spending a lot of time looking into the different ways that people think and the different ways that people perceive space and the different ways that people make decisions about movement in that space. Because I think if we can come up with some additional flexible models for how people move, it adds a considerably larger amount of nuance to some of the really diverse spaces that mass motion is being used to model. And so 
that's something that I think we need to respond to. And we're working very hard to make sure that we can fold that in. So that's where we're at from a research perspective. Uh, I'm delighted that we have someone full time within the team who is uh, working on that. And I hope that there's more to come uh, as we continue to grow. The second thing is I, I mentioned earlier that the pace of change in the design world and the uh, rate at which people are asking decisions in valid questions almost all of the time um, is has definitely increased, uh, at least in, in my uh, last 10 years or so in the industry. And with the rate of design changes, and that could be from a parametric design perspective, or the rate of testing various different operational scenarios, um, we've always wanted mass motion to be something that can exist throughout the life of a, of, a, of a project, a design or operations project. And so one of the things that we're actively looking into and trying to spend more time really um, integrating more tightly with is something along the lines of uh, not feeling like a siloed solution and more being more tightly coupled into existing design workflows. And so let me give you an example of that. This is something that we're exploring. So rather than this is thinking more about the long term, rather than something that is going to be coming out in two months. If I am working with uh, some of my colleagues, let's say I work for an architecture firm and someone has a new design in Revit or Rhino, bringing that into mass motion is not that hard initially. Uh, we've done a lot of work around like some of the BIM workflows to try and make that easier. But what happens if there's a slight design tweak? I don't wanna have to re-import the entire model. I just want to look at effectively like a change log. And if I've, had, if I've made a couple of changes to the vertical circulation in one wing of a space, I only want to reflect, see those changes reflected in mass motion. We're looking into a number of different industry data formats and that could be from things like data interchange layers like Speckle through to things like the um, uh, like IFC5, like upgraded um, IFC standards, or even things like some of the universal scene descriptions that exist in the, um, in the movie industry for how that you do a different appreciation of space. And so we want to effectively make it easier to ingest small changes to be able to more rapidly test things. And so you can build mass motion as part of your overall, how does this work design process? And so that's, it's possible now with some judicious work of the software development kit, I want to make it possible without any coding whatsoever. And so that's one thing that we're spending a great deal of time on because I realized that we don't want to have effectively a have and have nots um, user base where you have some people really hev heavily uh, leveraging some of the automation work that we have and some people saying, well, I don't go in for that. Uh, so you're leaving this behind. And we definitely don't want to leave people behind or make it so that you have to have a working understanding of Python in order to use mass motion. It's not what the philosophy of the product has ever been and it's not what it will be in the future. And so I think that's just important to say. And then I've talked briefly about the sort of the changes to, to movement and motivation. I think it is also, um, important that when we're looking at more flexible spaces, we're also looking at more flexible uh, types of people. You will know that we don't have like a pre-built preset for um, like a wheelchair avatar because uh, I, I push back on that because we don't want to tokenize or uh, pay lip service to um, a fairly broad spectrum of disability. And so, especially with a, a large geographic spread, so someone in a powered wheelchair in North America um, moves differently and is interacted with differently than someone with a manual uh, wheelchair in a, if we're designing a space in rural China. What we are going to do though, and this is, we wanna make sure this is based on as much research as possible, and we're also being transparent about that, is giving people easier options. And so one of the things for our new engine is really changing what we consider an agent to be. At the moment, it is an ambulatory pedestrian. It is a person that moves about as fast as the fastest person can sort of walk quickly or jog uh, and is as big as a big person. We are trying to expand the definition of that to encompass some of the questions that are being discussed when you look at active transport spaces or you look at the design of these facilities. And so that by necessity should um, encompass a bicycle, a wheelchair, someone on a mobility scooter, someone, uh, someone who is aged who needs the assistance of a walker, 
um, those sorts of things. And so really trying to look at broadening that out. The research basis for that is, is rapidly developing and the implementation of that is ongoing. And so I think that's an exciting space to be in. I think it is um, hopefully a good direction of travel. If anyone has questions about, I don't think you should be focusing on that at all. What you should be focusing on is bop, bop, bop. I'd love to hear about it because I think we are now at a size that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. And some of the features that we have put out in this uh, most recent release are a response to that as well. And so I'd love to have a conversation about that. So John, um, it might actually now be time for folks to, to ask questions or, or put them in the chat if you can't access the Q&A and we can go from that. But I just want to say thank you all very much for your for your time um, listening. Thanks, Lachlan. Uh, as always, Sterling Job. Um, we've got some really good questions uh, which have uh, come through and it uh, looks like you're getting lots of uh, appreciation as well, which is uh, always good to see. And uh, if I just scroll down go to the first question. Um, so uh, with the new additions to the SDK around elevators. How do you see these opening up new project opportunities for mass motion customers? Good question. So I fundamentally think that there was a class of elevator of, of vertical circulation based problems that mass motion you would sort of have to hand wave a little bit if I'm being honest. And so um, I would say that if you are um, focused purely on elevator movement, there are other solutions that do a good job purely looking at elevators. Very few people are actually constantly just looking at elevators because usually it's about the people that go in and out of them rather than the, uh, the, the, the pulleys and cabs and things like that. So I think it allows you to look at things like, and I'm trying to think of an example that is not confidential. Uh, there are some spaces, and they could be in the healthcare space. Uh, they could be in the uh, the justice space, where you have defined access limitations for who can use elevators when and where and under what accompaniment. That was quite challenging to do in mass motion up to this point. It is easier now. The second area is if uh, if I'm a major uh, engineering firm or architecture firm and I'm looking at, say, a, a really major high rise building or a really, really substantial mixed use development, one of the things that will be critical to the design of that space and the critical to the, to the design of the core is what is the destination dispatch system or the destination control system in some parts of the world. And so that's looking at how I actually move through my elevators and how the logic is, is assigned. That is something that we can't put into the software uh, because it's actually almost always proprietary information and almost always building specific and so owned by the elevator manufacturers. However, um, I think as the design industry around this evolves, there is a, a greater willingness sometimes from some of those folks to share or the ability to come up with a proxy destination control system. You can code that now in the SDK because we have made those controllers exposed to people. Cool. Um, next one. Uh, so you've mentioned wheelchair users. How do you model how the movement characteristics of a wheelchair differ from those of a pedestrian? Now, I know you mentioned that earlier on, um, but towards the end of the, the presentation, um, uh, with regards to the, the, the physical movement, but how, but how would someone actually model? Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's three components. Um, and these are these are components that you can that you can handle right now, and these are components that I would like to make easier over time for the users of mass motion. Uh, when we look at uh, when we look at users of a space with disability, and so let's say uh, people in a wheelchair, um, there are I think three things that you need to do. Uh, you need to make clear to the consumers of mass motion information, and they could be clients or they could be partners within your organization, that these folks have a disability. So at the moment that we have a, a pre-built avatar of a person with a cane to make sure that that's like the simplest possible representation of someone with disability, um, bringing in a custom avatar of someone with a wheelchair um, is not that hard and is used by a number of, of different users around the world. So having someone look like they're in a wheelchair is point one. 
Point two is having someone move like they're in a wheelchair. So we have um, a couple of preset profiles that come from um, London Underground that deal with things like what is the average space and what is the average um, movement. That is, I think, a, an okay representation, but is something that we would like to do a better job around um, turning circle around uh, acceleration, deceleration, things along those lines. Uh, there are a number of scripts that some of our users have run that get to that point. So that's point two. That's the sort of thing that where we will sort of bulk up our profiles over time, but I just want to make sure that they're really research, um, research based and also as transparent as possible where the data has come from, because there are a lot of privacy um, issues with this type of wheelchair and things like that, just to make sure that we're being as representative as we can. Uh, the third point is not so much about the person in the wheelchair, but it is about how crowds react to them. This is highly um, building facility and also geographically um, different or distinct in that some people, uh, in some cultures defer uh, to folks with a disability vastly more than some others. Uh, there are examples, and I'm happy to, if people want to, to have a conversation about this one-on-one, -on -one, um, happy to be reached out to. There are folks who uh, we have helped with writing some SDK scripts or you know, provided some general advice on how they would do that for having folks like pause so that you don't cut in front of a person with a wheelchair. We're probably gonna put some of that stuff in when we get to the new engine, but right now, all of that is possible. The first two uh, without the use of any scripting ability and the third using a bit of light scripting um, work. Thanks, Lachlan. Just conscious of time. I know we've got, we've got about 20 minutes left to go, but the questions are coming in thick and fast, Lachlan. Um, I'll try I'll just, and make I, my questions more. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'll just say, if we don't get your questions, any anything that is left unanswered at the end of the session, we will ensure that they are uh, answered and we'll put in, uh, in any few, any correspondence following the uh, following the, the, the recording today. Um, let's go on. Will there be any more support around 3D visualization for the future? Yeah, there will. Um, so I think there's a couple things that we will probably be doing in the short term, and that is the ability to, uh, and don't ask me about the timeline for this because there's a couple things that we still need to bottom out on a technical level, uh, I'm afraid. We will probably, through the SDK, um, enable the ability to move around an object that is not an agent. And so that could be able to be doing like simple visualization within mass motion, just to give people context. Uh, within mass motion right now, um, you have the ability to export the positions of, of each agent, and you also have the ability to take the Alembic file. Um, as the design and visualization industries get closer together, I think that's a, it's a pipeline going from the, the coordinates of the mass motion agents into higher level visualization work, um, say such as, as, as the Unreal Engine, things along those lines or bringing things into Unity is something that we would love to do more of. Um, I am spending a little bit more time being 100% honest, spending um, time focusing on the lower level movement to make sure that that's right so that it can be exported at a higher level of graphical fidelity, but it's not something that we're ignoring. And so we are actively exploring in addition to things like the Alembic system, what else we bring into the software to make that uh, a button click as opposed to, yeah, yeah, just write a script to translate it. Cool. Uh, one of your favorite questions coming up next, Lachlan. Uh, can you give us some more information on when must motion will support groups, please? Right. So um, those of you who have been on these webinars over the last couple of years uh, are probably getting a bit sick of, of me sitting up and saying, hey, groups are important. They're also pretty hard. Give us a little bit of time. Um, still true. For now, though, uh, if anyone uh, would like to help us, uh, we have a series of scripts that are effectively like a pre-alpha group circulation system, which is based on um, uh, a, a number of different academic papers across the years. We've blended them together for performance reasons. Um, I'm happy to share that to let people test it. Uh, which is how groups move in a circulation environment. Now, um, how when we do family groups to the level of ease that we currently have uh, people walking around where you say, I'm going to start here and go there, um, that will take a little while longer because of um, something like if I have a family group or if I have 30% of my population that is in a family group, what is the proportion of people that uh, if I'm in a queue, actually go up to be processed. 
let's say it's a family group, does mum go up and buy the tickets and dad is off with the two kids? Or do I, I would think that it's not just the two kids running around like crazy people. Like we're probably not going to model that, let's be honest. But um, how we do that separation is actually a relatively underdeveloped area from a from a repeatable sort of algorithm development perspective. So we're going to have to do some of that ourselves, uh, but we are actively working on it. So if people are interested in group circulation, I strongly encourage you to reach out to John or myself, and we're happy to share where we're at. Cool. Thanks a lot, Glenn. Um, on we go. Uh, so are there any examples of scripts available? Uh, so someone with very limited programming knowledge can start trying to understand and use this feature. Gotcha. So uh, yes, there is. And so we can always do a better job, but I think we're relatively proud of some of the script examples that you can that you can have in mass motion right now. So we uh, if you go and click on the script object, it's a little bit intimidating if you have no programming ability uh, or no programming experience. Um, I think if you have the motivation, you can have the ability. Um, it just looks like a blank text box and you go, what's going on here? The help guide has a number of different worked examples for those who have uh, not a lot of experience at all looking into to Python scripting. There's also, if you click the little uh, triangle button, a series of pre-written scripts to do things which are somewhat uh, common use cases. And so they could be extracting information or they could be running a model or things like that. Also, uh, when you install mass motion there's a number of different uh example files uh we change those over time we don't tend to broadcast them um unless we're doing direct uh training there is a script example object uh that has a number of different scripts that you can uh double click on and see how things work um failing that please feel free to to reach out to us and we're happy to direct you to various different resources the only line that i will put along that is um i'm not sure the mass motion product team is the best place to go for Python 101. Uh, luckily, there are a lot of places uh, in the world that are. And so we're happy to work uh, with you on that. Um, but that's kind of where we're, that's our position on that. Thanks, Logan. Um, I've got to, I've got to thank you for, uh, for this useful content followed with the question. Um, so how can we integrate mass motion with live BIM models? Are there any update to integrate with live Revit models with a mass motion model? Yeah, so that's what um, that's kind of what I was uh, discussing in terms of making that easier. And it's sort of um, it aligns with uh, Laura's uh, also hi, Laura, uh, a question around in interoperability and spec and things like that. I think that's where the design industry is and has is going and has to go. And we very much want to be a part of that. And that's not just speaking for mass motion, but that's speaking for all of Oasis. Um, we have investigated a number of different things like a like a grasshopper layer, like a speckle layer and things like that. Um, we are looking at how we make that as easy as possible in the particular use case for incremental changes, as I was discussing, because I think it is relatively straightforward to bring in an entire model and and define that. But really, the issue is as a particularly for things like infrastructure projects where you might have the same design that evolves over the course of 18 months, bringing in small changes to that is something that we're actively looking into. Um, we don't want to necessarily wait for the industry to settle on a standard. So we might come up with one or two, but that will be tied into the engine work because it fundamentally aligns with how you understand the base systems of mass motion. Hopefully that's not too much of a question dodge. <laughs> um, kind of a follow-up question for that, which just coincidentally is next, which is about uh, aligning those AutoCAD uh, geometries when uh, on those updated models, uh, particularly if the uh, it has different coordinates and angles. So, yeah, really good question. Um, there is a there is a thing that I can probably do a better job of in terms of uh, surfacing things in mass motion that some people may not know about that we don't, we try not to make a big song and dance about things. We're very proud of some of the work that we do, but we try not to be too, um, try to be a bit modest about things. Um, one of the uh, things that we did in version 11 was come up with a global coordinate system 
um, for uh, importing models. And so if I have, say, a, a large space where I'm looking at various different buildings and I'm going to be increasing them across the, um, the course of a design project, if you go into the project settings, you can basically, say, input a custom coordinate system rather than, like, tricking, not tricking, telling mass motion that 0, 0, 0 is actually potentially, you know, real world coordinates. That very much does help uh, with aligning various different things together. The second thing is in the version that we released a couple of weeks ago, um, that reference grid that I was talking about is also a snappable and alignable um, feature. And so you can basically use that as your reference point and you can use our existing snap and move tools and align to that as well as measuring across that. So it, um, I think that will help. I would, I would definitely give that a go. Cool. Thanks a lot, then. Um, this, is, this strategic accessibility map looks great. I uh, might have missed this in, in your intro, but is this function of access to a step-free circulation, or does it take into account distance, for example, for people with limited mobility who are unable to walk long distances? That's a brilliant question. Um, it, for now, right now, is looking at the difference between two different movement types. And so by default, it will look at things like step-free access. So, you know, can't use stairs. You can also, if you set up a network that is a, um, a limited subset of the model, you can look at the difference between those two sections. Pivoting slightly, so not dodging the question, but trying to answer the broader question here. Um, People with limited mobility who are unable to walk long distances, uh, I'm sure most people on the call here have uh, a relative, a friend, uh, a family member who are um, who are aged, uh, who are elderly. And that is something that we have had uh, Sarah, our researcher, look into specifically because I want to bring into when we're talking about the different types, like the broader understanding of different mobility types, I want to have it easier to model uh, folks who need to A, rest, and B, seek out an area that um, provides that rest. And so that might be looking at, say, a portal, but being able to tag that as a place for rest or something along those lines. If that would be useful to you, please do reach out because I'd love to have a conversation because it's things that we would like to do. But the more that we hear from people, the more likely we are to accelerate it in the, um, the overall development uh, timeline. So great question. For now, um, to be clear, step-free circulation is the primary focus, but we would love to enhance that over time. Just to add on to that, Lachlan, as well, I think we actively encourage everyone, all of our users, to actually reach out to us. Mass motion wouldn't be the tool it is today um, had we put our finger in the air and decided this is what this is what everybody needs. So please, if you are using mass motion, you know where we are, reach out to myself, Lachlan, or whoever you're your business development manager is your account manager. Uh, we're more than happy to have those conversations. Um, any prospect of a dynamic evacuation map? Last time agent left space, this would be very useful. Uh, which is different to the current evacuation map because, oh yeah, okay, uh, yeah. Yeah, there is. There's interest. Uh, I'd need to work that through uh, mentally. Um, I I hadn't considered that before, but I put that in in the same um, the same sort of overall um, category as we're trying to make things easier to get people the answers they need faster. And so, yeah, if people are like, you know, what would be really useful, the ability to extract this, because there probably is a way to look at the. Well, I mean, there definitely is a way to look at the time the last agent left a space. Um, but it's probably slightly convoluted and you might need to use a few filters, but in the same way that we added the, the histograms to get to that like single number um, analysis quickly, uh, we can take a look into that. Uh, yeah, Mike, let's have a chat. Yeah, if, uh, uh, an another question with regards to um, agent grouping, um, which uh, Sylvester, I'll reach out to you directly with, with regards to that and we can have a chat. Um, any progress on the ability to be able to globally or a number of selected objects check what actions have been applied to each object? When I have an issue, strange behavior within a model, I, I have to select and check each object individually, properties, actions tab. It will be very useful to be able to obtain a list of actions per object 
to be able to see whether they are related to the problem. So I think what we'd be talking about there is, um, again, this is another one of those for probably like under, under broadcast um, features in mass motion. You can audit uh, a group of objects uh, or a group of, of elements in your mass motion scene uh, by the property of them. Like if you right click and, and go to down to the, the audit um, option, you can audit them by a particular property. So give me a list of all of the different uh, things that have a distance penalty, uh, things that have a, an exit action applied. Um, or if you, you can also audit them by object, which is a list of here are all of the objects in my selection that have a, um, a non-standard property. And that, that could be like a delay put on a link or, you know, if something is gated. So something that is not a straight out of the box default. Um, those audit tools, I think are quite useful. Uh, to be honest, they don't get a tremendous amount of use other than with some, some quite heavy users there is probably something that we can do to make that easier. And so uh, again, that might be a follow-up conversation, but what I would suggest is, is taking a look at those audit um, options, but then being quite explicit about like, this gets me halfway, what I would need to get me the whole way is X. And then we can see if we can put it in, because it is something I think, going back to what I was saying about people are asking for more in less time, that also puts pressure on not necessarily the folks building the mass motion models, uh, but the folks checking them. And that could be the same person in some cases, or it could be like a, a, a senior engineer or a, a senior architect. Um, making it faster to check and to audit also makes things uh, faster. Like we don't want that to be the bottleneck is what I'm trying to say. And so we will, um, we will keep trying to improve that over time. Cool. Uh we're down to the last two questions, so we've done extremely well. Thanks, Lachlan. Um, so we've mentioned the ability of the SDK to be able to influence agent speeds within a certain zone of a model. Can this be done using the script tool? Is it possible to influence the agent direction bias uh, in this way within a zone? Speed? Uh, sorry, I'll give you... <laughs> I was about to just answer in, in sort of one thing. Um, I'll give you a more expensive answer. Uh, speed, yes. Um, direction bias, no, and I'll tell you why. Um, so you can currently look into effectively changing the, basically low level agent movement can be done and like looking into the forces and things like that can be done using the SDK. Um, it is a fair bit of work. Changing something like speed is is honestly fairly trivial, but um, for things like the direction bias or for things like agent size, the current uh, mass motion engine treats those as similar to like a person's DNA. And those of you who who I've trained in the past, I tend to think about the profile as the agent's DNA, like where a token may be like, do you have a bag or not? That is a changeable property across the course of a simulation, um, whereas something that is part of you. Um, I am the height that I am, I am the weight that I am, probably doesn't change across the course of a mass motion simulation. The direction bias is one of those things. Within the profile, we're effectively treating all of those as fixed properties. They can change in some circumstances. You can change the direction bias on a given floor, um, but something like moving the direction bias from within a zone is something that as we look at that change to what an agent is, we want all of those properties to be more flexible. Now, the thing that I will say to that is that is the thing that I uh, say to our technical lead and senior developers. Uh, and then someone very rightly will say, hi, Lachlan, great idea. Love what you do. Uh, the, they don't say any of that. Uh, the, the validation for that is going to take forever because you've now you've taken some consistent things and you have now uh, made all of those changeable properties. So in order for us to have confidence in what we are testing is going to take a really long period of time. Um, the compromise that I think we are going to get to, and I think this dovetails with the final question, which is on um, the, the release of the, the new version, which we've called release 12 in the past, is effectively, we want to give people the capabilities and we might say some of this has been, uh, if you, 
keep all of the settings as the consistent settings and you don't change anything, this is how we have validated it. And this is what we have benchmarked things against. And these are the validation and verification tests that it passes from both a um, regular pedestrian flow perspective and an evacuation flow perspective. Uh, and I haven't actually mentioned that too much, but we have also, actually that's really poor that I haven't mentioned it. Uh, we have upgraded our validation um, systems for fire engineering purposes to uh, take into account the new ISO standard. So that is something that is with the, the latest version of mass motion as well. That validation we take extremely seriously. Verification takes a lot longer because it's usually looking at real world approaches. That's going to happen in parallel and will continue long after we've released the new engine. So there will be a few features that we might be similar to what we did in the pandemic with the personal space parameter that we say, this is something that is going to be useful to people. We are going to keep working away in the background to make sure that this is um, as validated as we can make it. Um, so there is a little bit of uh, use at your own risk um, because we do take the ability to um, to trust this extremely seriously. It's probably the thing that we, we take the most seriously. Um, and so to answer that, things like speed, really easy to do right now. Um, things like the direction bias, we will be it will be easier to change in the new version. The new version, uh, I don't want to put too fine a date on it, but if people don't start seeing things uh, in the next year and a bit, I, especially some of our um, users who are who are comfortable helping us with the, like, this is where we're going, um, I think you all have the right to be uh, slightly aggrieved. So that's, that's where we're at. Um, then again, um, I did say a bunch of, of different things for... Um, uh, in 2019 and 2020, um, and then the plan changed. So uh, if various major things happen, um, that plan is, is subject to change. So all I can do is be as transparent as I can about where we're at. Thank Thanks for answering that, Lachlan. Just as well this isn't recorded, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we have nothing um, to hide, so I think it's all okay. No, we are, we are always open and honest. Um, so if there are any questions, uh, we've come to the end of, of the ones that are, are, have already been uh, asked. If anyone does have any more, uh, we'll give you a, a, a few more seconds um, while we wrap up. Uh, but also, just want to say thank you all for joining. Uh, it's great to see some some new and familiar faces on the call. Um, I think, did I see a hand pop up there? Uh, that may have been applause. Uh, yeah, I'll take the applause for you, Lachlan, that's fine. Um, but yeah, great to see so many new and uh, and familiar faces join us today we really appreciate you taking the time out of your day um please feel free to reach out to us at any time uh, with any questions or queries uh, if you're new to mass motion and you want to have a more personalized uh, presentation for the team we know where we are we're more than happy to arrange that for you and uh Lachlan, thank you very much for your time today also brilliant thanks folks thanks all for taking the time i know it's a busy time for everyone um and so i hope you have a really lovely rest of your day yeah. Thank you all.